this English adaptation of Leon Tolstoy is read by Winnie Morton and brought to you by E Magazine. How much land does a man need? Once upon a time, there was a farmer named Pahum who worked hard and honestly to feed his family, but had no land of his own. So Pahum remained poor. Why are people like us keep working the land since childhood, thought Pahum. Should people like us continue to die the same way they live, without a thing to call their own? Our living condition might be different if we own the land. Near Pahom's village lived a woman, a small landowner, whose farm amounted to 150 acres. When winter came, rumor spreaded that her land was up for sale. Pahom heard about it from a neighbor who just bought 25 acres from the old lady. She agreed to a down payment of only half the total price in cash. The rest of the money could be paid in a year. She is flexible. What do you know? thought Pahom. This land is being sold and I don't have a penny. Pahom decided to speak about it to his wife. While other people are buying, we could try getting about 10 acres. Life is impossible without real estate ownership. The couple started thinking and calculated how much money they could come up with. In a few days, they managed to save 100 rubles. They sold a fold and half their bees loaned one of their son's hand as a laborer and asked for cash. They borrowed the rest of the money from their brother-in-law and finally come up with the first payment. Originally, Pahom and his family rented a 20-acre lot with plenty of trees. The next day, he went to see the lady and made the purchase. This is how Pahom becomes a landowner. A year had passed. Pahom borrowed more money, sowed seeds, and had a good harvest. He managed to settle his debt with the lady and his brother-in-law. Now that he is a landowner, Pahom cuts down his own trees, fed cattle, on his pastures and meadows. Every day from sunrise to sunset, Pahom went out to plow the fields. He looked after the harvest and checked out the meadows. Pahom's heart was filled with joy. However, in his mind's eye, the grass that grew and flowers that blossomed at his farm appeared very different to those grown in other parts of the country. Before Pahom purchased that land, he thought it looked like any other. But now things appeared very different. One day, while sitting in front of the farmhouse, Pahom saw a traveler strolling by. He asked the traveler, where did he come from? And the stranger replied, that he came from beyond the Volga, where he had been working. One word led to another, and the man mentioned there were plenty of land for sale over there, and people were lined up looking for a bargain. The land was so fertile, the man said, the rye was as tall as a horse, and so dense, five sized Cuts made a sheaf. A handy farmer once worked out there, the man said, for a while, but now owns six horses and two cows. Pahom's heart was filled with longing. Why should I continue to suffer in this mud hole, he thought, while other people 
are living so well in other parts of the country. I'm going to sell my farm, and with the money I could settle over there instead, and everything will be okay. Pahom sold his farm, including his house, and his livestock. With profits from the sale, he purchased the property and moved in with his family. Everything the man said to him were true, and Pahom was in a much better position than before. As time passed, Pahom rented more arable lands and pastures. He was able to have the quality of cattle he wanted. At first, in the hustle and bustle of moving and construction, Pahom felt pleased. But as he got used to the new environment, he began to think he was not satisfied with this new place either. Pahom wanted to plant more wheat, but he didn't have enough land, so he went ahead and rented more land for three years. On good seasons, the harvest was good, and Pahom managed to save money. He could have continued living in the Volga comfortably, but soon Pahom grew tired of renting other people's land every year and thought, he suffered too much hardship. What if the entire place were mine, he said. I could be independent. One day a salesman passing by told Pahom that he just returned from the distant land of the Baskiers, where he bought 600 acres for only 1,000 rubles. The rule is you need to make friends with the Baskiers boss, he said. To do this, the salesman spent about a hundred rubles worth on dresses and carpets as gifts, as well as a box of tea and bought wine for the Basque's bus to drink. He gets to buy the land for the bargain price of five cents per square feet. Wow, thought Pahom, over there. I could acquire ten times more land than what I have right now. I need to take a hard look at this. Pahom entrusted his estate under the care of his family and began the journey to the Baskers, taking his servant with him. The carriage stopped in a small village to buy a box of tea, wine, and other gifts, just like the salesman advised them to do. Pahom and his servant continued riding until they covered more than 500 miles. On the seventh day, they arrived to a place where the Baskias had set up their tents. As soon as the Baskias saw the wagon approaching, they left their tents and gathered around the visitor. They served them tea, kernels, and slaughtered a sheep in his honor. In exchange, Pahom took the presents he bought from his wagon and which he distributed to the Baskiers. He told them he was in search of farmland for sale. The Baskiers were very pleased and suggested that Pahom should speak to their chief. They sent for the latter and explained to him what Pahom was looking for. The boss listened for a while, asked for silence with a gesture, and said to Pahom, Okay, choose whatever land you like. We have plenty of farmland for sale. And what's the price? Pahom asked hurriedly. Our price is always the same, 1,000 rubles per day. Pahom didn't understand. Per day? What kind of measurement is that? How many acres are there? We don't know how to calculate it, said the Basque's boss. We're selling the land per day, whatever amount of square feet you could cover while walking on foot in a day is yours, and the price is 1,000 rubles per day. Pahom appeared surprised. In one day, I could walk a huge area. The Basque's chief 
laughed and said, It'll all be yours, but with only one condition. If you don't return the same day to where you started, you lose your money. How would I know which path I need to take? You could go anywhere you like. We will be right there at the summit waiting. You could start your journey from here, taking a shovel with you. Wherever you think it's necessary, leave a mark. At each turn, dig a hole and pile up the dirt. We will follow you with a plow from one place to another. You can take any direction you like. But before sunset, you must return to the place where you started. All the land that you walked on will be yours. Pahom was amazed. He decided to start early in the morning. They chatted a while, drank more tea and kernels, ate more sheep until the night came. The Basques gave Pahom a juvet bed and said good night, promising to meet the next morning at dawn to the agreed starting point. Pahom stayed up all night. He had too many things running through his mind, and he could not fall asleep. He couldn't stop thinking about the huge farmland. This could be my best purchase ever, he thought. One could easily walk over 15 miles in a day. During summertime, days appeared longer, and a 15-mile journey could represent a lot of land. I could sell the most arid land to the peasants and keep the best part for myself. I could buy two yoke of oxen and hire two more farmhands. With 90 acres, I could allocate an area for planting. The rest, I could raise cattle. When Pahum opened the door, he saw that dawn was breaking outside. It is about time to wake the fellows up. Let's get going, he said. Pahom got up, woke up his servant, who was sleeping in the wagon, ordered him to harness the horses, and off they went to the baskers. It's time to go. It's time to go onto the step to measure the land, he said. The baskers rose up, gathered around, and so did their chief. The baskers began to drink more kernels and offered Pahom some tea, but Pahom didn't want to wait. If we have to go, let's go right now. It's time. The Basques got ready and everyone took off, some on horseback, others in carts. Pahom, being driven in his wagon by the servant, grabbed the shovel. When everyone reached the step, the morning sky was a mix of purple and red. They climbed up to the summit, aided by the lighting of the carts and horses, and onto the place where all gathered. From the summit, the chief approached Pahom and extended his arms towards the plain. He said, All of this, as far as the eye can see, belongs to us. Feel free to take whatever land you like. Pahom's eyes popped out of their sockets. The land appeared spotless, as flat as the palm of one's hands and dark as a poppy seed, with tall grass in the hollowed areas. The chief took off his hat, placed it on the ground and said, This will be the mark. You may start and return right here. All the land you walked on will be yours. Pahom pulled out the money from his pocket and put it inside the chief's hat. He took off his coat, leaving a sleeveless jacket, loosened his belt, tucked it tightly under his belly, put a bag of bread on the hidden chest pocket, tied a bottle of water on the belt, pulled off the shaft from his boots as he grabbed the shovel. Pahom is getting ready to start. It took him a moment to decide which path to take. All the directions were tempting. It doesn't matter, he said. 
Let's take the direction towards sunrise. He turned eastward, stretched, and waited for the sun to rise above the horizon. I must not waste time, he thought, for it's easier to walk while the early morning temperature is cool outside. The sun rays barely sparkled over the horizon when Pahom, shovel in hand, entered the step. Pahom started to walk at a moderate pace. After a thousand yards, he stopped, dug a hole, and piled up the dirt to make it look more visible. Then he continued walking. Pahom quickened the pace. After walking a while, Pahom dug up another hole. When Pahom looked back, he could see the hilltop beyond the sunlight, the baskets standing on it, and the glowing wheels of the wagons. Pahom estimated he walked about five miles. As the weather began to feel warm, Pahom took off his coat, threw it over his shoulder, and continued walking. As the temperature continues to rise, Pahom looked up, at the sun, he thought it was about time to get breakfast. So far, Pahom covered only one side of the rectangle, but he needs to walk all four sides in one day, and it is perhaps too early to make a turn onto the next side. Let me take off my boots, he told himself. Pahom sat down, took off his boots, attached them into his belt, and resumed walk. Ha! The ground felt easier on my feet at the moment. I could walk another five miles like that, he thought. And then I'll turn left. Wow! This place looks so promising. It would be a shame for me to skip it. The further Pahom went, the better looking the landscape felt. He walked on a straight line for a while. When he looked around, the summit was barely visible. People started looking like ants, and there was hardly a gleaming of sunlight. Ha! thought Pahom. I have made quite a bit of progress going in this direction. It's about time to make a turn. Besides, I am sweating and getting very thirsty at the moment. Pahom stopped, dug a hole, and piled up the dirt and grass. He took a sip of water, turned left, and continued walking. When he looked, the grass was getting taller and the temperature getting warmer by the minute. Pahom began to get tired. He looked at the sun, and it was about midway overhead. Well, he thought, I need to take a break. Pahom sat down, ate some bread, and took a couple of sips of water. He tried not to lay down, for fear he could fall asleep. After sitting a while, Pahom got up and went back to walking. Right now, he is walking without difficulty, but felt a bit slippy. Nevertheless, Pahom continued to power through, thinking, one hour of suffering is worth a lifetime of enjoyment. Pahom walked for a while in the same direction. He was about to turn left again when he saw a fertile valley from a distance. It would be a shame to skip that part, he thought. Flax could grow very well there. So he bears right, went through the valley, and dug up a hole on the other side of the road before turning around. Pahom looked back towards the summit. The air appeared misty and wavering from the heat, and through the mist he could barely see the basket standing on it. Ha! Ah, Pahom thought, this side is getting too long. Going that way could be shorter, and Pahom continued walking 
along the third side at a quickened pace. When he looked at the sun, it was about halfway to the horizon, and Pahom had not yet covered three miles on the third side of the rectangle. He was 15 miles away from where he started. No, he thought, even though the land looks good, I must walk back in a straight line right now. The finish line must not be too far away. I acquired plenty of farm land already. Pahom dug up a hole in a hurry. He started walking towards the summit where he started, but with difficulty. Exhausted from the heat, Pahom had cuts and bruises on his bare feet. His legs were getting weak. He wanted to rest, but it was impossible if he needs to arrive before sundown. The sun doesn't wait on anybody, and it was sinking lower and lower. Goodness gracious! If only I didn't make the mistake of wanting too much land. What will happen if I'm late? He looked towards the hilltop and the sun. He was still too far away from the starting point, and the sun was approaching the horizon. Pahom continued walking with great difficulty, but continues walking faster and faster. Although he quickened the pace, Pahom was still far away from the place where he started. Then Pahom started to run threw away his jacket, got rid of his boots, bottle, hat, and kept only the shovel, which he is now using as a cane. Woe to me! I wanted too much land, now I'm about to lose it all. I need to cross the finish line before sunset. Even though fear took his breath away, Pahom kept running further and faster. His soaked shirt and pants got stuck onto his skin, and his mouth went dry. Pahom's chest were moving up and down quickly. His heart started pounding like a hammer. Pahom's legs started to buckle, as if they didn't belong to him. Pahom was overwhelmed by the terror of dying from exhaustion. Although he feared death, Pahom couldn't stop himself. After running so far, they'll think of me as a fool to stop now, he thought. And he continues running. As he approaches the summit, he heard the Basques shouting and hollering. These shouts encouraged him to keep going. Pahom gathered the last of his strength and continued running. The swollen, hazy sun almost touched the horizon, looking pink-red like blood. The sun was getting lower, and Pahom was getting very close to where he started. Now he could see the Basques on the summit waving their arms for him to hurry up. In his final approach, Pahom passed the hat laying on the ground and the money inside, and the Basque's boss was sitting and laughing out loud. I have plenty of land, Pahom thought, but God forbid if I survive this trial to live in them. I'm about to lose my life. I am losing my life. I will never reach the place where I started. Pahom looked at the sun, which was already disappearing, and gone. With the rest of his strength, he quickened the pace, hunching his body so that his legs could barely support him. When he reached the bottom of the hill, it suddenly became dark. Pahom looked up to the sky. The sun had set, he screamed. All my efforts had been in vain, he thought. Pahom was about to stop when he heard the Basques were still yelling and hollering. He remembered, although for him, at the base of the hill, it seemed like the sun had set, but from the summit, the Basques could still see it. 
Pahom took another deep breath and ran up the hill. There was still sunlight up there. When he reached the summit, he passed the chief's hat. In front of him was the Basque's bus, who kept laughing out loud. Pahom let out a scream. His legs finally gave up, and Pahom fell flat on his face. Wow! What a brave soul, exclaimed the Basque's boss. Let's go see how much land you've got. Pahom's servant ran over and tried to lift him up from the ground, but saw blood gushing out of his mouth. Pahom was dead. The Basque's held their tongue to show restraint. Pahom's servant took the shovel from him and dug up a hole where Pahom was buried. Two feet from head to toe, that's all Pahom ever needed.